Hi, I'm Jeff Alpin, The Big Game Hunter, and today we're going to talk about 25 mistakes job hunters make when negotiating salary. Now, I used to work in recruiting. I did it for more than 40 years. I felt like 100 or more. And, um, you know, I helped a lot of people land in roles, like 1,200 full-time positions plus consulting assignments. Some of you think that's a big number. Some of you will go, eh, doesn't sound like a lot. It is a lot. And a, a lot of people I spoke with wound up in roles where they regretted how they handled their own negotiation. And they come to me afterwards looking for advice for what they could have done differently. So over the course of time, I've compiled a list of mistakes job hunters have made. Some of them I've released as individual videos. This one is a compilation video that I think will help a lot of you. So the first mistake is mentioning money in the cover letter. And I say that for the simple reason that so often, you've got to look at it from the receiver side of this. Don't, they don't have a way of judging your capabilities at that point. All they're doing is seeing a resume and a number, and that becomes easy for them to reject or say, I've got, I, I have a bargain here. So don't mention what you're looking for in your cover letter. It's pointless. And it only gives them a reason for saying no to you. Second one is over or undervaluing yourself. You need to know the value for what you do. And if you overvalue yourself, you're going to wind up in adversarial situations with an employer. And if you undervalue yourself, as so many people do, you're going to wind up you know, compromising on, I shouldn't say compromising, but selling yourself short. You're worth more. The market in your geographic area uh, pays more than what you're asking for you're giving away money that you're going to resent having given away. So I'll give an example. If you accept 5000 less than your real value, that doesn't sound like a lot until I say that's 25000 over five years. It you know, raises into that even modest 2% raises. It's more than 25000 And if you're sacrificing for $10,000, uh, that's more than $50,000 over five years. And that gets compounded over your career. So don't undervalue yourself. Don't overvalue yourself. The next one is becoming intimidated by the employer's prestige, their title, um, what they've accomplished, things along those lines. So you walk into the interview and you're kind of psyched out and allow yourself to compromise much too readily because this person is, oh, they're the senior vice president. They're the managing director. It's such and such company. And thus, in being intimidated by that company name or that person's title, you're willing to sacrifice yourself uh, in order to go to work there. You don't recognize, this is number four, you don't recognize that the first time that they're asking you about salary or money, they've started to negotiate. And they're negotiating before you've had a chance to evaluate them or them get to know you. So with this is number five, you don't hedge your answer to that question. How much are you looking for? I'm looking for such and such. Or, and, and thus, you don't hedge by saying, but I really don't know anything about the job other than the job description. I haven't met my future manager. I haven't met the team. I don't have a sense of the work other than what's in the job description. There's a lot I don't know. So I may ask for more. I may ask for less once I get to know more. So don't take this as a hard answer. Take this as, yeah, possibly, but I need to know a little, a lot more in order to commit to that number. Number six, being overly influenced by precedents, statistics, you know, cultural things, you know, taboos that an organization has. And thus, when they say things to you like, we never offer more than a 3% raise, 
you don't respond by saying, maybe this should be the first time, <laughs> right? <laughs> maybe this should be the first time. You know, after all, if you're a $100,000 a year person, a 3% raise is $3,000, and after taxes, and now after inflation, that's not really a lot of money, is it? You know, even a 5% raise isn't a lot of money. So uh, you have to kind of flip that stuff back at them so that they're not thinking that they can get away with even more later on. Number seven, acting desperate. You know, being, uh, appearing desperate gives away all your leverage because they know they can push you around and make you take what, you, what they want to offer. I remember there was someone I was coaching and, you know, when he would interview, it seemed like it went well, but kind of appearing desperate caused him to get turned down many times for the money he was really asking for uh, because they wouldn't give it to him. They would offer less than that because they knew he was out of work for a long time and thus his desperation oozed through his pores. Along with that is appearing nervous or anxious. You know, well, uh, yeah, and you know, they get the feeling that you're going to cave in because you're anxious about this. You're nervous about the negotiation. Uh, that signals to them that they can get you. Number nine. You know, on the other extreme is approaching negotiations like a cage match rather than a collaboration. Even if you get the money you want, you may damage your relationships with people once you come on board because this wasn't a collaboration. This was a or else scenario and you wore that on your sleeve. 10. Not considering the total compensation. You know, there were firms I represented when I did search, and they maxed out at salaries of 200, but their bonuses were 300, and their benefits were completely paid for, and lunch was delivered to your desk. Uh, yes, you worked through lunch, but they were delivering it to you, and you'd receive a menu every day as to what the lunch offerings were. So. There was a lot more than base salary that went into it. And with these firms that I'm talking about, these firms always did this stuff. There was never a break in what they did. Number 11, um, practicing what you're do, going to say in your head and not out loud. Uh, and thus, the corollary with this is not practicing at all or just, well, not practicing at all. Uh, and thus, uh, by not saying things, kind of like on interviews, when I tell people you've got to practice it and the words have to come out of your mouth, you know, what winds up happening is you make mistakes when it really counts because you haven't made the mistakes when it doesn't count. Next is winging it. You know, winging it is doing things ad hoc, uh, which again is... You've never thought it through and you just go into this and you just say, you know, whatever comes into, into your mind. Yeah, huge mistake. Next one is, and th this one is the beginning is, is I, I'll uh, attribute to a woman I interviewed named Kate Dixon, um, who has a book out called Pay Up uh, that deals with salary negotiation. When I interviewed her for, uh, for Job Search TV and No BS Job Search Advice Radio, uh, she referred to this as listening to your Uncle Hank, and I'll add in, or your Aunt Henrietta, because these are people who may have been out of the game for a long period of time and are out of touch. Uh, go to experts, go to people who negotiate regularly or have negotiated regularly, you know, even if you talk to a hiring manager, a friend of yours, they're in the position where they've handled their negotiations, but they haven't seen a broader spectrum. So they can give you a few ideas, but many of their ideas may not work because they just, they don't do it very often. You know, 
if they've hired 50 people, they've hired 50 uh, done 50 negotiations for themselves from the buy side where they had the power, not from the sell side when they didn't. They may have had three jobs or five jobs uh, where the pressure feels different. Number 13 is settling and not negotiating. Whatever they say, you feel compelled to go, okay. Um, I'm sorry, that's number 14. Okay. And agree to whatever has been said because um, you're afraid to negotiate. Next one is getting hung up on the little things. Like there was a someone I was uh, re- uh, coaching um, and he had an offer for a 60% increase in salary and it was not a $40,000 a year job, just to be clear about that. A 60% increase in salary, a huge bonus, fully paid for relocation. Uh, he could work where he was uh, while his wife was about to deliver their, their second child and his wife kept nudging him to bring up this relatively small item um, because she wanted everything. And his response was to say, hey, look, they're giving me a $100,000 raise at this point. And you're hang- getting hung up on a few hundred dollars. If they don't give it to me, I'm still taking it. Because why would I turn down $100,000 for a few hundred dollars? Number 16, being unclear or having fuzzy thinking. You don't understand what's really important to you. And as a result, um, you go into this not knowing where your absolute must-haves are and give away things that are unimportant. I remember a time I was being audited by the Internal Revenue Service when I started a business a like hundred years ago. And you know, there was an auditor there uh, who had been to my home to do the audit on five occasions and was being transferred uh, to another location and needed to close the case. And my accountant came to me and said, is there anything you can give this person so that you know, they feel good that, they, uh, that they're that uh, they clearing the case. And I offered up something that was worth $200 to the government. Uh, they took it and the case was closed. So I'll simply say, you know, not understanding what's important to you uh, is a mistake. 17, you only spend a few mi- uh, minutes on the offer materials and don't really go through them uh, uh, conclusively. So the offer material may just be the offer letter. Where's the benefits uh, information? Without the benefits information, you don't know how much you're really getting in the way of a salary increase, do you? After all, there are situations where the benefits package may be fine, but the cost of the benefits package is a problem. Uh, So suddenly you're going from 100% paid for benefits or 90% paid for benefits to 50. You know, that doesn't sound like a much, but benefits can cost twenty five dollars to $30,000 a year these days. And, you know, having fully paid for benefits has value to you. So make sure you understand, you know, everything that's being offered to you, what the title is, what the vacation policy is what the reimbursement policy is going to be on tuition and on expenses, what the benefits are and what the cost of benefits are. These are some very basic things. And if they try and sneak in a non-compete on you, hire an attorney if necessary uh, on any of this, because sometimes there are clauses that just don't make sense to you. And the person who's going to explain them to you has a vested interest in convincing you that, yeah, this is no problem. We've never done anything like this. And having represented someone who had signed a non-compete before I met them, he wound up being out of work for a year when he tried to take a position with another organization. People who tell you that non-competes are unenforceable don't know the law in all 50 states. Make sure, if necessary, you hire an attorney. 
Number 18, you give away your power so you can be seen as being nice. Now, the common thought about this is women and people of color often do this. And I must tell you, men these days do this as well, but they don't call it being nice. They, they uh, refer to it as going along because uh, their future boss asked them to go, well, I'll take care of you. And thus they sell themselves short and leave money on the table. 19, taking things personally. You know, in the Godfather movie, the classic statement is, it's not personal, it's business. Uh, and the more emotional distance you can get from the negotiate in the negotiation, the better you're going to do. And that includes the pressure from your husband, wife, or partner, because they've got anxiety too, and they dish it out on you, and that's going to affect your negotiation. 20, accepting the offer on the spot. I'd like a day or so to think about it. What are you going to think about? We gave you what you asked for. You know, one thing I've learned over the course of time is that if I say yes too quickly, I sometimes have to make mistakes. So I'm just asking for a day or two. I hear you. Yes, you gave me what I asked for, but just give me a day or two. I'll be back in touch with you tomorrow or the day after at the very latest with a decision. And thus, you lose that leverage of the pressure of them having to wait. So that when you circle back to them in one to two days and say, you know, I was thinking about it, and yeah, I shot a little bit too low. Could you do a touch better? And not, you know, not putting that pressure on them. 21. Well, this is actually pretty early in the process. You're out of work because you quit without having someone else. So you lose your leverage. Uh, and thus, unless you have a large bank account, you wind up showing as desperate. Number 22, being too grateful. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate this. This is wonderful. Don't be so freaking grateful. Now, it, it shows you as weak. And on their side, they'll start to feel as though maybe they did too well for you and can push you around once you're on board. 23, you focus in your negotiation on need or greed <laughs> rather than your value. I need this versus I'm worth this uh, becomes is the mistake in your focus. No one cares what you need. They care about what your value is to them. Number 24, you don't negotiate at all. You know, you basically say, thank you, I accept. Now, there are rare instances where that's okay, but there are rare instances. Instead, always try and do a touch better. And, you know, often the simplest way to do that is when they uh, extend the offer, be silent for a minute and then say, huh, and let the silence do the work for you. Because in doing that, it puts pressure on them and causes them to worry. Number 25, and this is the last one, negotiating against yourself by asking for a particular salary and following it up by saying something like, but I'm willing to negotiate or I can be flexible because then you're signaling to them that they can get you for less money. You're negotiating before they've had a chance to draw value out of you. Don't make that mistake. So that's tw the top 25 I see. Hope you found this helpful. Don't make these mistakes. Before you go into a negotiation, contact me and schedule time for a coaching session. You know, it's very simple. Go to my website, thebiggamehunter.us, and in the subject line, oh, and, and there you there's a drop down where you can schedule time for a coaching session. If you choose the discovery call section and try and get me to reveal how to negotiate, I'm going to bounce it out. Uh, I'll simply say. Schedule time for a coaching session with me. I'll help you with the negotiation. 
Also, connect with me on LinkedIn at linkedin.com forward slash IN forward slash The Big Game Hunter. Imagine that you saw this. I like knowing I'm helping some folks. And once we're connected, you know, you know, there's a lot that you'll get from me in the way of information. Hope you have a terrific day. And most importantly, be great. Take care.